Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord that uh, we are enjoying the services since uh, we came. I pray that this final lap of the our worship this morning, the Lord will minister to us in Jesus' name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want you to commit yourself into God's hands. Tell the Lord to minister to you this morning. And God's presence, and God will minister to every one of us. Pray that nothing will distract your attention as we look at God's word this morning. The Lord is here with us. Father, we bless you this morning. Thank you very much because you have been ministering to us since we came. As we look into your word now, we ask that you bless everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that you take away every distraction and help us to understand the message you are passing across to us. We bless you and thank you very much because we know you have heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have an important topic this morning. And uh, it's like a follow-up to what we had in our side the scripture. So the topic we are considering today is finality of Christ's sacrifice. Finality of Christ's sacrifice. You are aware that we have been in the book of Hebrew for a while. So um, the message will be also taken from the book of Hebrew. So I want every one of us to pay attention for what God has for us this morning. When you say finality of anything, it means the final. It means that that is, yes, you cannot get anything after that. So when we say finality of Christ's sacrifice, it means there's no other sacrifice other than what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. So whatever sacrifice anybody is doing now, it will not, it will not, it will not get God's attention. It will not be able to please God. The Lord has done it all, and his sacrifice was final. So that is why it is very, very important for us to uh, pay attention to what we have this morning. Like I told us, we'll be studying Hebrew in our side of the scripture, and we continued it today. Um, but we need to understand the background of the book of Hebrew. The book of Hebrew, um, though the, uh, the um, theologians have no concession of the writer of the book of Hebrew, so we still leave it as it is but an apostle have written the book of Hebrew. And what was the purpose? The purpose of the book of Hebrew, uh, the writer was writing to the Hebrew Christians. These Christians have had um, background of Judaism. They know more about the sacrifices, the law of Moses, all the temple laws, they were, you know, they, they, they were very familiar with all of this. Now, when they came into uh, Christianity, they started being persecuted. And um, why were they persecuted? They were no more keeping, like the Bible told us in the book of uh, Colossians, the new moon, the, um, the, the laws of Moses, the legalistic laws, that's associated with the Old Testament. And they were receiving severe, um, sac uh, uh, severe persecution from their people, from the other Jews that were not uh, Christians. So on this basis, the writer of Hebrew wrote them to encourage them 
and also to let them know the superiority of Christ's sacrifice over the sacrifice that was done in the Old Testament. So that's why it's uh, very, very important um, that we look at this. So the apostle, the writer of Hebrew, uh, started the writing by telling the, his uh, audience, who are the Jews, uh, converted. What actually uh, was contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant. And he outlined what, uh, what the, the, uh, each of them represents. In his um, writing, he, uh, which he, he, he started with the previous um, verse, uh, chapters or um, passages before this place we are considering, which is Hebrew chapter 10. We're going to look at from verse one to eight. But before then, I have told them that the new covenant was, um, was, was different from the old, uh, old covenant written in the tables, you know, which they have to recite and learn, uh, you know, in memory, thou shall not kill, thou shall not do this, and so on, so many of them. But he was telling them that the new, uh, the new covenant, in, under the new covenant, the laws of God will be written in our hearts. That means that if a person is converted, he doesn't need to be taught about those uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the new com the old commandments that are not the things that we the, the the law of God will be written. That means we will naturally by the uh, Holy Spirit know what God wants us to do. If someone is born again, the Spirit of God takes over his or her life, and he begins to minister to. To, to them, the things that God expects them. So nobody, you are not going to be taught or going to uh, uh, carrying a, a, a book to try to memorize what God wants you to do. It's just embedded in your heart. So that's the first uh, contrast. And then he also tells them that um, the service of old covenant is a shadow of what was to come and it was limited. So everything that was done in the Old Testament was a shadow. And you know that a shadow is not a real thing. If, a, if, it goes out, if you go into the sun and you are looking at somebody, are looking at the shadow of a person, that shadow is not a real person. So that's what was telling them that the old covenant was not exactly what um, it was just a, 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 a preview of what God was preparing for his people. And then he went ahead to also tell them that the old covenant could not make those who involved in them, uh, you know, involved in the sacrifice perfect. Um, that means also that the Old Testament was not able to make the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the people uh, practicing it perfect. That is complete. They were not able to do the will of God. And that's why you read in the Old Testament, you see where the children of Israel were still complaining, murmuring, doing all kinds of things. It's because, and that sacrifice is done year after year. It wasn't making them, but they couldn't attend to God's standard. So that's what, what the, um, Old Testament, the, the, the Old Covenant was to them. And also, the writer of Hebrew made them to understand that the Old Testament was just a temporary uh, law that God gave them. It is not permanent. So, and then he went ahead us to um, compare with the New Testament, a uh, new covenant. He said the new covenant was, uh, the new covenant through Christ uh, was brought, uh, brought cleansing, eternal redemption, and eternal Inheritance. That is the, the new covenant. It brought hope, it brought cleansing, it brought redemption. All that God wanted to do, um, he fulfilled it in the Lord Jesus Christ. The new covenant as well was dedicated by the blood of Jesus Christ. It was, that's why we say finality. It was done once, and that is all. It cannot be repeated like it's done 
in the old New Testament or the old, old covenant. The year in, year out, they were sacrificed. You go to high priest every year, and the blood of goats and bull would be killed. And it was just like a ritual. But in the new covenant, it was done once. The Lord accomplished it on the cross, and that was it. And then um, he also reminded them that the old covenant had many sacrifices, which we have seen, but the new covenant had been established to one final perfect sacrifice, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. So that was um, what the writer of Hebrew was trying to pass across to the, his audience, the Hebrew Christians, to make them know that what they are trying to, or their men, their, their, their countrymen who were not believers are trying to force them. That is just a temporary thing, just a shadow. It's not the real thing. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the old covenant. So he wants to make them realize that. And um, he further uh, also wants to make them to realize the office that the Lord Jesus Christ holds, the one that fulfilled the old covenant, is a high priest. And his high priesthood is unique. And he, he, he made them to realize that he is sitting at the right hand of majesty on high. It's not equal with angels. It's not equal with any man. He's just sitting up there. And then he went ahead to make them know that he is better than the angels. As well as also, he said, God has put all things under his feet. Why is he doing this to them? He's trying to make them realize that the Lord who fulfilled the condition of Old Testament is the perfect sacrifice of God. He has, he's just had, he has no comparison at all. So that was what the uh, writer of um, the Hebrew was trying to uh, pass across to them. And then he also made them to realize that he's the faithful high priest. He's, he, he, he's a calm, counter worthy of more glory than Moses. You know, as the Hebrew writer also said, told us that the person that built house is more worthy than the, 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 the house itself. So Jesus Christ is the, is the builder of the house and that is how more glory than Moses who wrote the old covenant for them. So he was trying to let them know. And also we know that Aaron was high priest, but he said that the high priest of Christ is more um, higher than that of Aaron. And also, uh, as we saw in, in um, some, one part of the, um, the Hebrew, he said that the high priest uh, of Christ is made all in order of Melchizedek. It is contrary to the laws of high priest. He didn't follow the ironic um, um, uh, lineage. So that's why it is, it is um, made in order of Melchizedek. And then he says that the high priest he's talking about is holy, harmless, undefined, separated from sinners, and higher than the heavens. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the one that God sent to die for us. That is the one that fulfilled the condition of the old covenant. I'm going to look at this topic this morning um, as we look at um, what we, uh, the Lord has for us. We're going to look at it on a tree subheading. The first one is the shadow and substandardness of the old covenant. The shadow and substandardness of the old covenant. We are going to read Hebrew chapter 10 from verse 1. Hebrew chapter 10 from verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of things of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the commerce on, uh, thereon to perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those Sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible 
that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Here we can see again what the writer was saying, that the old covenant was just a shadow of good things to come. It was not the real thing. It was not the actual thing that God was proposing. And also, he was drawing uh, uh, closer to all that those who do it, they, they were doing a kind, of, a kind of a ritual. Every year they go. And he said here that it was not possible that those that was involved in them have been made uh, perfect. Uh, then, and then he said, but that, that those sacrifices, that there is a remembrance again of made of sin every year. Every year, they will go to the high priest, they will do the sacrifice. They will go back again. Those who are start fighting with their wife continue to fight. Those who are abusing Moses, those who are murmuring against God, they continue what they are doing. It's just a ritual. And that is, that is what God saw, and God knew that this is not my will. This is not my purpose. This is not what I intended this thing to be. And God was walking, um, you know, uh, uh, walking towards bringing a perfect sacrifice, which was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, also, we saw there that the Old Testament um, sacrifices were insufficient, ineffective, and incomplete. It could not save, it could not deliver, it could not, um, you know, make those who practice them perfect. They were still struggling with sin, and that was why God says God was not uh, happy with them. Most of them perished in the wilderness because of stubbornness, stiff nakedness, and rebellion against God, though they were doing these sacrifices. That's why God now uh, brought in a, uh, a, you know, um, a perfect sacrifice through the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to look at Hebrew chapter 8, verse 5. Hebrew chapter 8, verse 5. It says, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see, said he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount, on the mount. So we see here that, um, here the, uh, uh, the, the, the Bible says that it was just example. It was still talking about the old covenant. Example of shadow of things to come. It is not the real thing. So that is why we, uh, those uh, you know, Jews who are involved in it, we are still struggling to over, overcome sin. And um, we look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Colossians chapter 2, read verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, or the body is of Christ. Here again, the, uh, the, the, now the, the writer of Colossians uh, is Paul, the apostle. So he's not telling us, let no man. Why is he telling them? Uh, the Judaizists, uh, Judaizers, uh, we are really coming into the church to persecute the church, the, the, those of Jews that believe. And he's trying to force them to try to practice those uh, 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 days, those ceremonies they were doing, you know, uh, observe this day, don't observe this day, and so on. He said, no, let no man judge you. You are free from those things. You have been set free. No man should judge you. So he just telling them that uh, these things are just a shadow of things to come, and they should not, uh, you know, be judged about them. And then um, he, uh, the, 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 we, we all also see that they that, that um, go into the uh, practice, the old covenant, they it could not make them perfect. As we have seen before, they were not able to do the will of God. They were not able to please God. That's why it, don't, it could not make them perfect. They are not able to, you know, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They have, uh, you know, they have the human nature and therefore they couldn't please God. But um, the one that came to fulfill it, Jesus Christ, 
I fulfill it. And as we go on, we will see what is the effect of the death of Christ, of the sacrifice the Lord Jesus did on the cross. So uh, we have seen that. I also want to look at um, the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his only son, on, um, his own son, in the likeness of, of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. What the law of Old Testament could not achieve, we see here that because it was weak, and then based on the sacrifices, the Bible says God sent his only son come in the, in, in, in the flesh to be able to die for us so that we will be able to live victoriously over sin. Christ's sacrifice satisfies God's uh, demand for eternal salvation. So it's very important. In the book of Galatians, we look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the, of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even, uh, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Here again, he's telling us that the sacrifices, uh, the sacrifices of the old covenant could not justify us. The rituals, you know, and the, the laws of old, the ceremonial laws of the old um, um, covenant could not make us perfect, could not save us. And that is why um, we need to redirect our attention if you are thinking that, um, you see, we also sometimes do sacrifice. You know, maybe you are, um, you do some work in the church, you come early, you clean the church, or you sing in the choir, or you do some other things in the church. That's, that's a sacrifice, but it's not enough. That will not please God. You're, it's good, that's good work, but you must have a relationship. It is that relationship with God that will justify you before him. And that relationship come with accepting the offer, you know, the, 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 the offering this God has given through Jesus Christ. We are going to look more into that today. So uh, don't ever think that uh, I will be justified by regularly coming to church. It's good to come to church, but it's not enough. We must have a relationship. We must establish that link between us and God. And that's why Jesus said, when we pray, say, our Father, until we all come to that point, we can boldly say, God is my Father. And if you look at the sense of old, like Paul says, and my God, until a point, a man, a woman, we come to that personal relationship and say, my God. And if you look at David as well, they all get that personal experience. God becomes like a natural father. I can boldly go to because there is a relationship. And that is what God is telling us. It's not just a sacrifice. It's not that I'm doing these religious activities. I am doing this and so on. They're all good in themselves, but they cannot justify it before God. So that's very, very important. Um, I'll look at Acts chapter 13. Acts of Apostle chapter 13. I'll read from verse 38. Acts of Apostles 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. 
So we see here that it is through Jesus Christ we obtain justification, which couldn't have come through the law of Moses. So it is uh, God himself has um, established it for us that we could be justified through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at um, the second subtopic, which is submission and sacrifice of Christ. What did Christ come to do for us? From uh, the text also, which we have read, we understand that God was not satisfied with mere sacrifices. Thus, rituals, uh, killing of uh, goats, year in, year out, sprinkling the blood, and doing all kinds of things, God was not um, satisfied. And that was why God himself made his own uh, you know, um, ar arrangement, though the plan of salvation had been done right from the foundation of the earth, and it was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll look at Hebrew chapter 10, which is our main text from verse 5. Hebrew chapter 10. From verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings thou withest not, but a body has thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O Lord. Verse 8, above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and um, an offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast uh, pleasure therein, which are of, offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Here we see he taketh away the first. That's the first covenant that could not save, could not make the, uh, uh, the commerce perfect. He taketh it away because it was just a shadow. It was just, it was not the real thing. It was just um, <clears throat> a mere shadow of what was to come. And that's why it says, he taketh all the first and that he may establish the second. But we will see here from that we read, uh, it's quoted from uh, the book of Psalm, Psalm 40. Psalm 40, I'll read from verse 6. That was where the writer quoted his, uh, the, verse we read, the verses we read in uh, Hebrew. Psalm 40, we read from verse 8. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not desire. My ears hast thou opened. Bond offerings and sin offerings thou, thou hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will. O God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Here we see the writer of um, uh, the psalm here was uh, you know, telling us that God does not delight in those offerings and uh, burnt offerings and sacrifice which was done in the Old Testament. And that was, what is it? Well, he said he came to do the will of God. What is the will of God that the Lord Jesus came to do? He came to die for the sin of mankind. He sacrificed, he gave himself over. He surrendered himself willingly to die for our sins. That is the will of God. That was the original plan of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled it. In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, Matthew 26. Matthew 26. We read verse um, 39, Matthew 26, verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face 
and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it, is, if it be possible, let this call pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. We can see here that the Lord came to do the will of God. We saw uh, from there the agony he went through, the, uh, you know, the, um, the suffering which he went through. And remember that it was a perfect sacrifice. It was perfect in that there was no sin in him, he never committed any sin. But how is it that he went through the suffering? It was to do the will of God. Even when it was not uh, his own will, but he wanted to do the will of God. That is the submission. And that is the sacrifice of Christ. He submitted himself willingly to do the will of God. In the book of Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, from verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Here we see the, uh, the uh, Paul here was writing to the Philippians, let this mind, which mind? The mind of humility, which was in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, as even saw so today in our, um, you know, the side the scripture, he came in, you know, and um, he, uh, uh, he, he denied himself of the glory which he enjoyed in heaven, and he came down here, and he humbled himself as like a man to die for our sin. That is humility. He left all, all his glory and he came to die for our sins as a man. So that was the sacrifice he did. And St. Paul says, this is humility. Let that same humility be in us as believers. Sometimes you deny yourself you, the things that, that you are right to be able to serve one another. That's what he was trying to communicate to them. That if Jesus Christ could leave his heavenly place with all his glory to come and die for us, we also supposed to do that to one another. Sometimes, uh, you know, like anomaly child people, when you help, uh, sometimes uh, help is a sacrifice. It may, it, may be con con um, it may not be convenient for you. Someone is coming to uh, ask for money from you, and you know that, um, well, this money I could have used it for another thing. But... Um, he, this person that's asking the money needed it most, needed it more than myself. It's a sacrifice to give that money to the person, you know, to be able to satisfy and make that person happy. So it's a sacrifice. And then Jesus did the highest sacrifice for all mankind. He died and uh, emptied himself of his glory and came to die for us. And then to be able to save us from the hand of the devil. So that's what he came to do. And St. Paul now said, let this mind be in you. In the book of Hebrew, chapter 9, verse 26. Hebrew, chapter 9, verse 26. Hebrew, chapter 9, verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, as he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This is what the Bible says here. The Lord Jesus Christ came to put away sin, to condemn sin by the sacrifice of himself, which is um, a very important and that is why the same Hebrew chapter 2 uh, told us that how can we escape this great salvation? That is why it is great. Because he died, he gave himself, he suffered terribly for us. And that's why he says, how can we escape? And if you are here today, consider what the Lord has done for you. Think about it seriously. 
And that's why Hebrew is saying, you can't escape it if you brush aside all the sufferings, all the agony he went through on the, in, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and all the beating, all the blood that came out. If you neglect, if you do not accept the sacrifice and make your way right with the Lord, the Bible says, how can you escape it? You cannot escape the judgment of God if you do not take this sacrifice of Christ and allow it to work in your life. And then um, someone may say, well, I think I have accepted Jesus Christ. But the issue is, what has the sacrifice of Christ? Because if in the Old Testament or Old Covenant, the rituals, the sacrifice, the daily, the yearly sacrifice could not make them perfect. Now, consider us now in the new covenant with the blood of Jesus have been sacrificed for us. And now someone said, well, I am now I've accepted him. I'm a clean person. I've, I'm okay. I've gotten salvation. And yet, you are still practicing sin. You are still sin, even though we don't know it. Secretly, you are still telling your lies. You are still doing whatever you are doing. And as a young person, you are still committing your immorality, come to church, sing, and jump up and down. It means that you are just living in the old. Because the new covenant, which is meant to deliver us from sin, to set us free, to make us free, so that we have a relationship with God, you have not accepted, it has not worked in your life. That's why sin is still reigning, and reigning uh, uh, perfectly. So you need to think seriously, because the Bible says, how can we escape? If all that Jesus suffered, and we are here playing religion, and jumping up, and yet our life is not what God expected. The sacrifice in which the God could not accept in the Old Testament, he still will not accept it. It's only one sacrifice, which is the one the Lord Jesus did. And if we accept it, it, takes, it changes our life. It transforms our lives. And that is why we need to think seriously today. If you think I am born again, I've given my life to Christ, what fruit of salvation are you bearing? What type of fruit is coming? Can your neighbors or your co-workers testify that this person is completely a changed person? We used to sing those days. He said, the things I used to do, I couldn't do them anymore. Because it's difficult. It is the, the root of those things that make you tell lies and you tell it today, I'm going to tell it tomorrow. Continuously, you practice sin. The root is still there. But if it is taken away, you can't do it. The Bible says the person that is born of God does not commit sin because the seed of God dwelleth in him. When, uh, you know, sin's up, um, um, root is taken away, the spirit of God comes in to dwell with the believer. And he cannot do those things he was doing before. He cannot practice sin. He cannot be doing, uh, you know, practicing at home, come back and be jumping up and pretend to be a Christian. No. His life is completely uh, clean. He's a Christian, open and in the secret because he knows or she knows that her life is seen by God. It's like a, a, a paper that is open before God. So that's why we need to think about what the Lord has done for us and whether we have appropriated it, whether the effect of the sacrifice of Christ has touched our life and make us what God expects, you know, uh, God expects us to be. That is um, very important. Now, God's acceptance, acceptable sacrifice is one that leads to repentance and sincere uh, willingness to forsake our sins. In the book of Psalm, Psalm uh, chapter 51, Psalm chapter 51, I'll read from verse 16. For thou desirest not sacrifice, as would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite spirit, O God, thou wilt not despise. 
I don't know whether we understand what he said. This, this says, the, thou desireth not sacrifice. All the rituals of the Old, uh, um, old uh, Testament, Old Covenant, could not please God. The killing of goats and everything that was done then, was God was unacceptable to God. And then he said, or oh, else I would have given it. Well, you know that this psalm was written by David. And then in uh, verse 17, the sacrifice of God are a broken heart. That is the sacrifice which God accepts is a broken heart. A person that hears God's word, may be a Christian, or you now hear God's word, oh, there is something I'm still doing that is not right. It feels bad. He goes to God in prayer and says, God, please, now I know that it is not right. Forgive me. A contrite spirit, a spirit that can easily be touched by the Holy Spirit, not a hardened spirit, not the one that comes to church and sit down and you talk and talk. You say, well, you, you can continue to talk. See, tomorrow, I will, this is where I stand. You know, he's not ready to move. He's not ready to ask the Holy Spirit to search him or her. So here he says, yeah, the sacrifice of God are broken spirits. You hear God's word, your spirit is broken. You say, oh God, I know that this thing I'm doing is not right. Maybe you are uh, taking something that doesn't belong to you, and you are doing it, and nobody has seen you, and you hear God's word. You, if you have contrite spirit, you will go back and say, God, I'm very sorry. I now know that this thing is wrong. Forgive me. You know, God will forgive you. It doesn't mean you are not a Christian. You are, but I mean, it even means that your spirit is so sensitive. You can always, you know, when you hear God's word, you tremble at his word. That's the person that pleases God. You know, so, uh, but if it's a, a person that when he hears it, no matter what he says, it doesn't bother him, it doesn't bother her, that person cannot please God. Whatever sacrifice they are doing, you may be working in the church, you may be singing in the choir, you may be ushering, if whatever you are doing for God, that sacrifice, it doesn't please God. Unless you have that contrite spirit. It says, a broken and a contrite spirit, O God, thou will not despise. No, God cannot despise a person that comes and says, God, I'm very sorry for what I did yesterday. I know I did it foolishly. Forgive me. You know, God will not despise. As long as David that wrote this, wrote it on an account. It was when he committed um, a sin against um, uh, you know, Bathsheba. That's, and then Nathan came to talk to him about this. So that was on the account he wrote this. And we know God eventually forgave him. So if you have done something wrong, if you have a contrite spirit, if you have a broken heart, you will hear, as soon as you hear God's word, you are ready to change. You are ready to say, God, I am very sorry. And you go to God and ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you and you continue to live your life. And you will be so peculiar to God. That's why David was a man after God. He was, it's not because he was perfect. We know his, uh, his up and down. We know his, um, his shortcomings. But because he had that tender heart, you know, whenever a prophet come, uh, uh, go, to, go to him and, and tell him, this, you are the person. He didn't, he didn't stop fighting with the prophet. He repented. He cried unto God. And that was why he was a man after God's own heart. If you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart, you must tremble at God's word. You hear it, you would say, God, I'm so sorry for what I've done. And then God will forgive you and you continue to have a good relationship with the Lord. We are, I um, go to the last subtopic we have today. And um, the last subtopic is salvation and sanctification in the new covenant. There is salvation. The salvation we are talking about is the one, the, the Bible salvation. Because there are so many people that are carrying fake salvation. I am saved. Saved, uh, uh, I've been in this church for 10 years, 20 years. That's perfect. You see? But do you have current salvation? Salvation that if the trumpet sounds now, you go to heaven. Or if there's something that takes your life. You know, you are, you, you are not afraid to die because you know by the grace of God, your life is right with God. You can, if anything happens now, you know you are sure that you will go, you will make it. 
You are not afraid. That is the type of salvation we are talking about. Not the one that, oh, uh, well, I am saved. And then every time we talk about death, you are, you are shrinking, you are so afraid. Why are you afraid? Because you are, your life is not right. If, you are, if, if your life is right and your death is coming, you know you are going to a better place. So why are you afraid? So that's why we are talking about this salvation today. It is the one that will, you know, cleanse us. It is the one that will save us from sin. In the book of John, John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, the gospel according to John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, we take it away the sin of the whole world. Not just one tribe. Sometimes we say, oh, Jesus is a Jew. And some people become so funny. They say, well, uh, Jesus is like a black person. Jesus, they try to want to know what, how Jesus looks physically, you know? Well, that's immaterial. But John says, behold, it was whom he was he telling? He was telling his disciples, look at him. Look at that person that I'm talking about. He said, he's the one that take it away. Before Jesus died, he has already knew that this one is the Lamb of God. God revealed to him by the Spirit. That was why he was telling the disciples, before ever Jesus even, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was telling them, look at him. Look at him. He's the one that will take away the sin of the whole world. And that is why today, you need to ask yourself, is my sin taken away? Am I, am, I, am I still committing sin? If your sins are not, even if it's tiny one, tiny, James said that if you do all the ten nine commandments and fail in one, you are a transgression of the law. That is true. Because if you say, well, you see, sometimes people uh, try to showcase their strength, where they are good at. Those, those places that are weak, they hide it. You know, if you are a stubborn person, you know, God knows. If you are a wife, uh, you know, that is not submissive to the husband, God knows. If you are a husband that is always bullying the wife, God knows. You know, you may cover it up because we are not there. But the Bible says that it's one that takes away the sin of the whole world, cleans you and gives you power. So we not, that you will not be able to sin. It will be difficult. I don't, I don't think anyone says I'm a Christian and then you are ready to fight your, your wife. You know, remove your clothes and say, I will beat you today. I, I really don't think, I know that I don't think that person is not a Christian in the first place. Because the root of the, 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 the thing that makes a man or a woman fight is taken away. You can't fight. You cannot, you know, start to box one another. No. So that is what the Bible says. The sacrifice which Jesus came to give us is wholesome sacrifice. It's the one that cleanses us. It is not the sacrifice of bull and goats, you know, the rituals that is uh, killed every year, and yet it doesn't make the commas perfect. But this is the one that can make us perfect. When you say perfect, it makes us complete. It makes us people that God can see. God says, yes, I'm happy with your, your, your lifestyle. You know, you are, you are meeting my standard through the power in the, in the blood of Jesus Christ. So that is what God is saying. So, and that's what Jesus came to do for us. So we need to understand this very well so that we will not just be carrying historical salvation. Salvation of 10 years ago. Oh, I remember when I was in church, when I was in um, Africa, how we were, go, uh, you know, we tell all the stories. What is uh, the current thing now? If God calls you home, will you make it by, in all honesty? We need to think about that. So, um, so we, 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 we have established the fact that this salvation will be, is a real salvation. It's one that takes away completely uh, our sins. It's a full salvation which um, uh, has been provided uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. When we believe in Christ's sacrifice, we are saved and receive grace and power to live victoriously. So the Bible says in John again, 
chapter 1, verse 12. John, Gospel, chapter 1, verse 12. It says, but as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become uh, the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Receive the power of God. My brethren, that's what makes a Christian different from a religious person. A religious person hasn't got the power, but a Christian that received Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of God, you receive him in your heart, you confess your sins, you accept him, he gives you power. It's inner power that is in you that those things you are doing before, you can't do them, you hate them. Like uh, my brother that was teaching inside the studio mentioned, um, the lady we uh, listened to her say, uh, testimony, last, um, uh, you know, the one we sent, uh, some of us, we have gotten it, the American lady. We can see the testimony. It is not in the meantime, people can judge her by heart word. No, no. Her inner woman has been changed completely. And you can see that the things she were doing before, she couldn't do them. That's where salvation starts from. It's not outward. Because some people will go the other way, uh, dress like a Christian, look good, look like a Christian, but the word is bad. Jesus says it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a fifty sepulchre, a whiter sepulchre. You look good, very, very good. But what is inside? That's what we are judging. It must come, our transformation must come from inside outward. You know, your life is changed, completely changed. And then any other thing, dressing and we take care of yourself uh, with time. So that's why we, uh, we, 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 we need to understand this. That's power that God gives us to be able to live a victorious Christian life. You cannot mimic it. You cannot try to do it. Oh, let me walk like a Christian. Let me dress like these people. Let me be like a, a deeper life person. No. If you, if you try to do it, you will fail. Because a, a, a serious temptation will come in your office. Someone will try to aggravate you, try to provoke you. Before you know it, you, 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 you lose your temper. And start, and start uh, uh, you know, shouting. Or at home, you can't mimic it. Your husband will try to you know, provoke you if you're a wife. And then maybe your husband is not even a believer. And before you know it, you, 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 you go with him and start, um, you know, changing words. But the one we are talking about is the inner one that if someone abuses you, God bless you. God bless you. You know, it's just there. The peace of God is there. So that's exactly what we are saying. Now, also we realize that when we believe in Christ Jesus, we are saved and then receive the grace, like I said, his death as well brings sanctification. Holy living. Now, before we close this message, I just look, uh, talk a little bit about sanctification because what people have done now is put it in their head. Sanctified. Uh, born again. Sanctified. Um, baptized in the Holy Spirit. We all carry it in the head. My brethren, apart from what is inside you, sanctification also has the effect of uniting the Christian. We are uh, in, a, in, a, in an assembly where Christians cannot see an eye, uh, see eye to eye, we need to suspect what they call sanctification, no matter how you profess it. Where people are not in, 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 um, in talking time, the atmosphere, when you come, you know that these people, they're not, they're not friendly. Things are, things are not right. We need to suspect the type of sanctification we have. Because people will say, oh, I'm sanctified, I'm, I'm having, uh, you know, it's in my heart. No. Jesus prayed for unity. That is one condition of sanctification, the unity of the church. We all come in, we love one another. If my brother offends me, I will go and ask my brother, you have offended me. And if that my brother has sanctification, say, oh, my brother, I'm very sorry. Or my sister, I'm very sorry. I didn't know that that will offend you. And we go our way. He can easily reconcile the two people that are sanctified. He's not the only one to say, well, um, Sister A said, well, I, I think I'm okay. But that but we hide something in her heart. We're avoiding Sister B. We don't want to talk to her. And yet he says, I'm sanctified. See? Oh, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. No. That's why, uh, let me tell you, that's why the power of God is not moving. We cannot deceive God. We can only deceive ourselves and all people that don't know our heart. So there's unity in sanctification. That's what Jesus prayed for. If a, a, a congregation is majority they are sanctified, you will see that, that there will be perfect unity. Things will work out. People will, will love one another. And you will not be settling quarrel here and there and misunderstanding. 
So that is very important for us, my brethren. And um, uh, I, I want to read uh, Hebrew chapter 10, verse 10. Hebrew chapter 10, verse 10. Hebrew chapter 10, I'll, I'll read from verse 10. By which we, uh, we, by which we, we are um, sanctified through the offering of the body of, of, of Jesus Christ once for all. What he did on the cross did not only stop in salvation, it gives us sanctification. Like I said, sanctification is, uh, if you want to, if you want to uh, use another word, it's holiness, holy living. It is not uh, uh, um, something we carry in our head. It is just be like, be like Jesus Christ. I'm able to forgive people. I live my normal life. That's, it's, not, it's not a special thing. Um, people carry it and uh, like the mock of old who just separate themselves, go to one place and say, uh, I don't want to mix with people. No, you live your normal life. You are able to say truth when there is truth to be uh, told. And uh, you're able to uh, forgive one another easily. And uh, you're not an object of temptation. Because uh, sometimes, again, we need to watch. Uh, some people say, well, you see, my brother, I know you have the grace. You can forgive me. And we become, we constitute obstacle, a stumbling block one another. Always offending people day in, day out. You wait, wait, what you say, what you do. If your wife, what you do at home, you know that this man doesn't like this. You do it. Oh, because I know, you know, my brother is a... Uh, He's a pastor. He's a, he's, he's, a, he's a man of God. I know that uh, he will forgive me. No, we, will not, we shouldn't be an object of temptation, object of making people to stumble. If you, you are sanctified, you always want to please your neighbor, you know, for edification, like the Bible says. Your, 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 your husband, your wife is your neighbor, and you want to do things that will please them, that will edify them, not to pull them down. That is also sanctification. Not just I'm sanctified and we are carrying it in our head. No, it must be positive. Uh, affect, you know, everywhere you go, your sanctification be positive. Affect positive, uh, you know, you, you, you try to be like a salt in, in wherever you go. That is what sanctification does. So you have told us here, and then in verse, uh, in verse 14, it says, for by one offering he had perfected forever, them that are, that are sanctified, has perfected, has made complete everything. There's no, nobody can add anything to it. You can't say, well, what Jesus did was half. Let me complete. No, it is perfect. You can't change it. You can't turn it upside down. So that's what the book of Hebrew is telling us. And um, those who want to see God on the last day must be sanctified. The Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you want to see God, not only even uh, when we are there, even now, in your circumstances, if you want to see God, when you pray, God will answer you. You must be sanctified. You must have a holiness of life. If you want to see God in your business, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you want to see God in your business, you must be sanctified. If you want to see God in your family, Blessed are the pure in heart. In the book of, uh, let me even read it. In the book of Matthew chapter uh, 5, verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Because when we say seeing God, we will see God eventually. We will see God when we die. But we can still see God while we are living. Our circumstances, God will be proving himself. When we pray, God will answer us. That's seeing God. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. He said, um, you know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I just wanted to read it so you know that I'm not quitting from my head. So we must see God. So if you want to see God in every area of your life, you must pray for sanctification. You must pray to be like Jesus Christ. You must live your life so that he says, let your light so shine that others, the co-workers, your people in your neighborhood, your family, don't say, well, uh, you know, I'm... Um, when I go to church, I behave like a well, in this family, I'm the head, I can do anything I like. No. Your light must shine in your house. Either a wife or the husband or the children, 
Your light must shine in your family. You don't destabilize the family. You don't go and be putting, creating problems in your family. No. We must all live like Christians anywhere we go. In our offices, uh, in our businesses, and everywhere we go. That is, the Bible says, for they shall see God. I believe God has spoken to us, my brethren, today. And we want to go to the Lord in prayer and commit ourselves for what God has taught us today. And pray that um, God will touch our lives. If you know that you have lost your salvation, you don't have it. Even though you are professing it, you can pray now. God is merciful. He will bring you back. If you have not get got salvation, you are still struggling with sin, you can talk, you can curse anybody you want to curse. You can stop stubborn and abuse leadership wherever you are. These things, you can bring them to God. Remember, a contrite spirit and a broken heart, God will not overlook. This afternoon, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And I want you to talk to God that God will help you. Christianity is not religion. My brethren, let's bear this in mind. Religion, like we saw, Old Testament is just religion. They were practicing religion. They were not made perfect. But Christianity is Jesus Christ coming to give us power to live a victorious life. This small afternoon, let's all go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to help us. Let's pray that the Lord will bring us back what his intention is. The sacrifice of Jesus must not be in vain. It may not just be, oh, Jesus went to die for me on the cross. What has that done to you as a person? You need to tell God, help me. Help me. Look at the areas you are weak and cry unto God. God is a merciful God. He will hear, hear you. He will deliver you. He will give you power. You must have that power to be able to live a victorious Christian life.